Good morning, everyone. We start the hearing number 13 of the 184th regular period of session of the Inter-American Commission of, of Human Rights, which is called Human Rights Situation of Sexual and Reproductive Rights Women Defenders, called by the Mesoamerican and Caribbean Women's Health Network and the Mesoamerican Initiative of Women Human Rights Defenders. I'm the presenter, I'm the president of the commission, and I'm here with the second vice president, Margaret May Macaulay, and commissioner Roberta Clark, uh, reporter for LGBTIQ rights persons. Also, we have uh, Maria Claudia Pulido, uh, reporter Pedro Vaca, and reporter for uh, Redesca Soledad Garcia Munoz. Let me start by greeting the civil society, and I will explain the distribution of time first. Civil society will have 30 minutes for the intervention. I will thank you if you introduce yourselves when you start speaking, then we will have the intervention of the Inter-American Commission for 30 minutes. And finally, I will give the floor back to the civil society for any final comments. Having said that, I give the floor to the civil society. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Aurora de la Riva from the National Network of Women Human Rights Defenders in Mexico. And I am here with my colleagues Clara Cardona Tamayo from the Latin American and Caribbean Women's Health Network. I'm the coordinator, thank you. Alejandra Burgos from the Salvadoran Network of Women Human Rights Defenders. Karina Sanchez from the Mesoamerican Initiative of Women Human Rights Defenders. We thank you for having uh, granted us this important hearing that arises from this alliance between the Mesoamerican Initiative of Women Human Rights Defenders and the Latin American and Caribbean Human uh, Women's Health Network. We address you to present updated information on the situation of women defenders of sexual and reproductive uh, rights in the region. We consider that the context is dangerous and the patterns of violence against us are very serious and the impacts of COVID-19 in our lives and activism are also very serious as well as the approaches on proposals to have protection from a feminist and women's human rights approach. In order to speak about the context for the sexual and reproductive rights advocacy, let me tell you that throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, with some exceptions, we observe the rise and consolidation of political and religious fundamentalisms in which laws, public resources, and the entire institutional infrastructure are used to favor private interests, to have a setback on earned rights, to plunder the territories and to restrict the social and political mobilization of the population with uh, impunity. Also, there are multiple social inequalities, the co-optation of institutions by organized crimes and the precariousness of living conditions due to the globalization and neoliberal policies that have hindered the effectiveness of human rights for a significant part of the population, specifically for women. In 2020, in Latin America and the Caribbean, approximately 4,091 4, femicides were committed according to the report on by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, and one in three women were victims of sexual violence according to UN Women. The incidence of murders of women in the region is bordering on pandemic proportions. This is an impact on various human rights, such as sexual and reproductive rights. And so the Inter-American Commission itself has reiterated that it continues to be a challenge for states to implement public policies that includes comprehensive sexual education, free, safe, and legal abortion, as well as family planning and emergency contraception to be free of obstacles in order to be easily accessed and exercise. An example of this situation is that countries such as Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Suriname, Haiti, and Dominican Republic, and, uh, Dominican Republic restrict 
women who exercise the, their autonomy over their own bodies, criminalizing and prosecuting them for deciding on their maternity. COVID-19 has worsened many of uh, crises already faced by Latin America and the Caribbean, which has aggravated the situation of violence faced by women, even more so in terms of sexual and reproductive rights. Thus, 18 million Latin American and Caribbean women have not had access to contraceptive methods during the pandemic, which has generated an increase of at least 22% of the birth rate in the region, around 3 million unsafe abortions and more than 1,000 preventable maternal deaths. During the pandemic, the guarantee of these rights has been in decline. In spite of this, we have identified that the risks to which women are even more, more so exposed, exposed are not directly related to the transmission of the COVID virus, but actually to the access that states must guarantee to justice, contraceptive methods, sexual and reproductive health, and access to safe, informed and accompanied abortions. In other words, unfortunately, the states have not adopted comprehensive and immediate measures to respect and guarantee women's sexual and reproductive rights, as was recommended by the Commission on several occasions. The risks for advocating for sexual and reproductive rights now. In the first place, despite the commitments to protect women human rights defenders, Carrying out this work in the region continues to be drastically dangerous, regardless of the issue or group of rights that are being defended. This risky situation is exacerbated in the case of women to human rights defenders because they carry out this work as women. And it is seen in campaigns of stigmatization, criminalization, and physical attacks that in some cases have led to the death of our fellow defenders. The case of Berta Cáceres is one of the most renowned cases in the world, but in order to show this reality, only in Mesoamerica, the defense of human rights has cost the lives of 22 women defenders in 2020, 16 in 2021, and seven so far in 2022. State agents and other actors are responsible for these acts. As for the 2,290 attacks, recorded in this region according to our organization during 2020 and of the uh, 5,400 in 2021. In Colombia, at least 145 human rights activists were assassinated in 2021 and 182 in 2020, which is a lower figure, but the evidence of the upturn of violence after the 2016 peace process. So far in 2022, there have been 86 murders and between 2013 and 2019, there were 1,339 attacks against women leaders and 84 cases of homicide, most, most of which were unpunished. The situation is no different in the case of women defenders. We face contexts in which this group of rights is still not recognized as human rights, and there are various groups acting to restrict them openly, openly such as fundamentalist churches, ultra-conservative groups, and even economic um, powers who act against our lives, our communities, and our social groups, with which we challenge the male chauvinistic and patriarchal structures that continue to exist in our countries. I give the floor to my colleague, Ale Burgos. Violence in defense of sexual and reproductive rights, patterns, perpetrators, and emblematic cases. Based on the regional monitoring system of aggressions of our organization and the work of REMSLAG, we have seen cases of aggression against women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights, their organizations and families, which have allowed us to identify patterns of violence against them. I, I am Defensors, Defenders has offered a small sample of the reality of the Mesoamerican region by identifying that between 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021, there were 186 aggressions against collective um, groups that defend sexual and reproductive rights, and these attacks were exercised against 
36 women defenders from Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. 2021 was a year of significant violence, which is evident among women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights, largely due to the measures linked to uh, the pandemic by COVID-19. Among the patterns that we identified, we see that most attacks are focused on questioning the credibility of the work of women defenders, because this amounts to 31% of the attacks, included in the registry between 2020 and 2021. Also, there's a dissemination of false or manipulated facts and harassment, as well as surveillance, monitoring of actions, and, and harassment of daily life. Many of these practices happen through the digital, through digital acts, since seven percent of these attacks were uh, digital in 2020, and 25 percent of them went were digital in 2021. Also, before the Inter-American Court of on human rights for the Manuela case, which obtained a favorable sentence in 2021, there were 30,000 attempts of sabotage against the web page of the organization. And there was a campaign called 40 Days for Lives focused on providing false information and slander about the work that is being developed in the country. They urged to commit acts of harassment and surveillance at the her headquarters, which is also space shared with other human rights organizations. Despite the increase in attacks through virtual media, physical violence continues to play an important role. In the sense, it also continues to increase alongside with verbal and psychological violence, and they represent 18% of the aggressions. An emblematic case has been of the Mexican defender Ariadne Song Anguas, who among many of the attacks she has denounced, she said in December 2020 that a group of fundamentalists arrived at the vicinity of her home to break her vehicle, to paint graffiti, to, to throw eggs and a Molotov cocktail bomb, which resulted in a fire. Many of the physical aggressions identified occurred in the context of feminist protests or mobilizations that promote an agenda of sexual and reproductive rights. March the 8th, September 28th, or November the 25th have meant in countries such as Mexico, the prevalence of repressive actions by state security forces through practices such as tear gas and even arbitrary arrests and criminalization. When it comes to aggressions directed against organizations or collectives that work in defense of sexual and reproductive rights, the actions that prevail against them are smear slander campaigns, as well as the dissemination of false facts. Also something important is that these organizations and their staff face the criminalization based on norms that make it possible for them to face criminal actions, as well as the overload of work divide from the unjustified and arbitrary application of fiscal and administrative controls. There an, an emblematic case is that of Vanessa Rosales, a defender from Venezuela who is a member of sev several sexual and reproductive rights defense collectives and has been imprisoned since October 2020 for supporting the termination of a pregnancy of a 13-year-old 13, 13 girl who was a victim of sexual violence. Vanessa has faced an investigation with multiple irregularities. Also, we see the, the cases of the Clinic for Humanitarian Services in Sexual and Reproductive Health, led by Mexican defender Sandra Peniche, who has protective measures from uh, since 2018 after an assassination attempt against her. And despite this, she has continued to denounce various attacks in 2020. In the context of the pandemic, she denounced that three agents of the municipal police of Merida arrived at her clinic and threatened to arrest the manager and two people who were working as cleaners. First, they accused them of stealing, and then they began to question their activity in the context of the health situation. Situations such as the above are especially evident in countries where 
we are witnessing the consolidation of authoritarian models aimed at eliminating any kind of criticism of the power exercised, including the, that made from the defense of human rights. This occurs in countries such as Nicaragua, where sexual rights and reproductive rights organizations are not exempt from aggressions, such as the cancellation of their legal status or the confiscation of their assets. Since 2018, 463 organizations have been canceled, of which 56 are feminist or women's rights organizations. As for the perpetrators on in individual attacks, the state, through police and armed forces, represents between 13 and 21 percent of the recorded aggressions, while members of religious Groups have been identified as re responsible for 13% of the attacks in 2020 and 11% in 2021. It's important to know that a significant part of these acts come from unknown persons whose identity has not been possible to determine. This is an obstacle for filing complaints and is a reflection of the impunity. It should also be mentioned that aggressions carried out by defenders' relatives have been identified, which also which is one of the aspects of the risky situation suffered by human rights defenders, uh, women who are, um, who are attacked for these facts. In attacks on organizations, most of the perpetrators identified were members of religious and fundamentalist groups accounting for 38% of attacks in 2021. This is a particularity for this type of defenders. As in other cases, most of the perpetrators are state agents. The same percentage coincides with, the un with that of unknown actors. The situation of women human rights defenders in particular and women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights shows that states have been responsible for a lack of protection by action because it is sometimes the same officials who attack us or hinder our work and by omission as well because they have not suggested or implemented mechanisms to guarantee our right to defend our rights and because through impunity they have shown that they are permissive in the face of multiple expression of hatred, persecution and violence that we suffer in almost all countries of the Americas. We also identify as an omission the lack of socioeconomic opportunities that causes our exclusion and is evident in a human crisis that many of us are currently suffering, particularly as a result of the COVID-19. I give the floor to my colleague, Clara Elena Cardona. I will be talking about the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on sexual and reproductive rights. Regarding the pandemic, we found that disinformation and fear led citizens to adopt or support authoritarian measures, which increase our risk situation and weaken social support for our work, which was strictly limited by confinement, with presidents set up as those who were going to rescue the world. We see that governments are the main perpetrators and have greater impunity and social tolerance to silence those of us who denounce human rights violations. Within the groups of women human rights defenders, we consider that women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights have been particularly affected by the pandemic. We have not been considered or have been partially considered in the multiple reports and recommendations issued by national and international organizations on the impacts of the pandemics and the actions to be taken. The Latin American and Caribbean Women's Health Network has found through its national, our national links that at least in 11 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights are not benefited from government programs of humanitarian support since we are not considered as a vulnerable population, although most of us are women from popular sectors who have dedicated most of our lives and time to the defense of human rights. And we live because of the activities carried out by NGOs to which we are linked or because we also conduct unpaid activities in our communities. Many of us have informal jobs apart from our social and political, political activisms and our care work. Also, 
the study from the same source obtained qualitative information summarizing the main impacts of the pandemic as follows, layoffs and job insecurity. We um, explored the basic needs of women defenders. This allowed us to identify that women defenders need money to pay for our basic needs. And this is clear because many of us have been unemployed since the beginning of the pandemic. Our organizations have no projects or we have not been able to work in informal jobs. Although the number could be, high, could be much higher, the total number of human rights defenders requiring humanitarian aid, according to our study, um, amounts to 1,000 activists in only 11 countries. The groups indicated as in most need are rural and extremely poor women defenders, LGBTQI human defenders, single mothers, women sex workers, HIV positive women defenders, and some homeless women defenders. Also, we have identified little flexibility on the part of cooperation agencies for humanitarian aid and for redirecting project resources to pay for the basic needs of women defenders. Fourth, there is also a lack of access to sexual and reproductive health services, lack of resources for the acquisition of contraceptive methods. And a very serious impact is that many of us have been and continue to be victims of the domestic violence provo provoked by our partners or husbands. Also, there is a better to our work as defenders by public identity entities and officials who stigmatize, stigmatize our work. And lastly, there is also the overburden of care work. Also, our study includes other physical and psychological impacts made uh, by the COVID-19 on women defenders. For example, emotional and psychological effects due to fear, uncertainty, and these violence, persecution, and stigmatization suffer um, or conducted by state institutions and fundamentalist and religious groups. Also, we are suffering from emotional and psychological conditions such as anxiety, insomnia, depression, stress, sadness, fatigue, sense of insecurity, fear, difficulties in adjusting to the current reality and other issues that affect our mental and physical health. Also, our bodies and lives have been also impacted by the lack of access to comprehensive health care, and this affects our sexual and reproductive rights. In view of the above, we women defenders have built networks that have allowed us to do precisely what we have been talking about in this hearing, to start from the local and collective level to analyze the context, the risks, to record the attacks, to identify the perpetrators, as well as to observe and to have different types of information on the different impacts caused by the pandemic and other situations in order to build alternative responses to protect ourselves. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Karina Sanchez. I will be talking about feminist perspective on the protection of women human rights defenders, comprehensive feminist protection faced with effect ineffectiveness and the non-existent of a state protection mechanisms to guarantee the right to defend without affecting the integrity of human rights defenders. Um, the network has been developing strategies and actions to promote our well-being and, to, and our protection in order to be able to continue doing our work. In this context, we believe that guarantees to defend human rights must be comprehensive and can be considered from a feminist perspective. This means that in order to understand the specific situation of women defenders, it is necessary to understand that risk come not only from our work as defenders, but also from the fact that we played a role that inserts us in the public and political spheres, which has traditionally been reserved for men. It also means incorporating the fact that violence is exercised against us in a different way. We are violated by other types of perpetrators. All these situations and the discrimination that we experience make us face different and greater vulnerabilities and impacts. In other words, we need to consider other elements on unequal power relations. 
family context, community and national context and circumstances in which we operate. We need to analyze the actors involved and their narratives, and we need to take into consideration other conditions of exclusion, such as our ethnic origin or our socioeconomic circumstances. Likewise, implementation of this approach implies understanding that women defenders are diverse and that there are no recipes or measures that can be generalized, but rather we must be participants. We need to establish our protection needs and a set of priorities. This is to make our struggle sustainable, to protect our well-being and to give an, a central pace to self-care and to collective care and healing as a right. Feminist integrated self-care. Taking into consideration our research, which were which was already mentioned by um, previously, um, it is evident that at least more than 1,000 women defenders need psycho-emotional support and humanitarian humanitarian attention. The network implemented its model of collective psychological care, a proposal for comprehensive self-care so that women could address the impacts, co impacts caused by the pandemic online and they can use techniques for care rela relaxation and other holistic therapies so that human uh, women defenders do not feel alone. More than 3,000 women participated in these spaces who came to face-to-face -face workshops before the pandemic and during the confinements, we have a space that is called, you are not alone, we are in a network. This attention model could be replicated and implemented by state agencies, social organizations, and the international community. It is a possibility to accompany these defenders and give priority to their experiences request in view of the serious situation that we have presented today we request the commission to remind the state that in first place sexual and reproductive rights must be respected since the lack of guarantee of these rights in the region leads to our work as women defenders states should fulfill their duty to guarantee the life and health of women for which it's essential to move towards the approval of regulations that respect physical autonomy and the right to decide on our own bodies and to discriminalize abortion in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Suriname, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. Second, states should address the problem of maternal mortality, forced maternity, and any circumstance that generates a differential risk for people with the capacity to bear children. Three, a state should guarantee comprehensive sexual ex education, access to sexual and reproductive health services, including emergency contraception. And four, a state should comply with their rulings, recommendations, and appeals issued by the Commission and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in this regard. Secondly, in the face of the reality and since the demands um, stated above, above are unfulfilled, we request that the states be urged to guarantee the exercise of the defense of sexual and reproductive rights, including that women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights can freely exercise their freedom of expression and association, as well as the right to protest without being subjected to repression or persecution of any kind by public agents or private actors. Second, to promote actions to recognize and make visible the relevance of the work of women defenders in our societies, as well as to um, train public officials about their importance. Third, to ensure that attacks against women defenders are duly investigated and punished. And fourth, implement and or modify protection mechanisms and policies for women defenders so that these mechanisms have a feminist approach, which also means considering the specific needs of women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights. Finally, we urge the commission to incorporate an integral feminist protection perspective within the various tools that are available and in which women human rights defenders are addressed, especially those of sexual and reproductive rights defenders. 
Second, to incorporate an integral feminist self-care perspective within the various tools to accompany women defenders. Three, to include women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights as a priority group in the strategic plan that is being drafted for the next five years. Fourth, to recognize the importance of sexual and reproductive rights as human rights and support the work of women defenders of these rights. Five, to create a follow-up mechanisms of on recommendations related to women or human rights defenders and to have an action plan that allows the commission and the rapporteurship on women's rights and the rapporteurship on women on human rights defenders to make timely interventions or pronouncements in the face of the initiatives and circumstances that threaten our rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, representatives of civil society. Now we will have the participation of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I would like to ask Margaret May Macaulay, second vice president of the commission, if she has any questions or comments for the representatives. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for very instructive and interesting presentations. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, uh, um, I, and believe me, I am wholly in your, in your uh, court in this matter, because the situation um, of opposition to the autonomy that women have for their sexual reproductive health and rights um, is, is um, being attacked more and more each day, every day. And, um, but one thing is that most people have the idea that the attackers of these women defenders um, are men. Yes, the majority, I think, that of the records that as far as I know are men. But I wanted to ask if you have any data or figures as to the number of women who attack these women, sexual reproductive rights or, uh, uh, defenders. And, and if you do, if I can identify what kinds of attacks women make against these defenders and uh, what, uh, and, and if you could um, get disaggregated data as to the ages of both women attackers and male attackers, and, and also the, the, we can be able to differentiate the kind of attacks the various sexes do. And in this way, I think it will assist us better to, to create uh, appropriate and comprehensive uh, defenses against their manner of attacks. Uh, um, um, so that we can best uh, try to, to uh, diffuse them um, effectively. Um, and I think we, we um, must be creative uh, um, in, in dealing with this. It's, it has been around so long and it's seeming to get worse. Um, so we have to be creative um, to, to um, have a more effective protection of um, um, women's sexual reproductive rights defenders. And, and we must also be attentive enough to them and quickly um, when they need assistance, because they do, uh, they suffer from PTSD and all sorts of things and the effects of the trauma of the attacks that they all receive. Um, so, and this, um, I am, um, of course, I say as a matter of, of accepted fact, uh, relates to all women of all races and, and um, all ages, in fact, throughout their lives. But I, I would particularly ask that we get some information as to the situation with indigenous and Afro-descendant women, sexual reproductive rights uh, defenders and as to the gravity of their situation in, in this regard, or is it less? 
um, do they receive less um, attacks, uh, uh, harassments, um, killings, uh, femicides, uh, and some of them, in fact, suffer from sexual attacks, as we know, um, in, is, is part of the move to, to interfere with the work. And, I, and, and, and can you give us information about whether there exists con, um, consistent and periodic training of all personnel in the judicial and justice uh, systems, lawyer, including lawyers, uh, uh, um, health professionals, those in education, in fact, across the board of ministries of government, because everyone in the country ought to have training about the right of women to their sexual reproductive health and their right to determine this for themselves, um, um, their, the use of their bodies for themselves. And if you do have um, any um, such training being used for the general public, if you can let us know what form that takes. And, um, and I, think, I think when we make statements about we should have people accept that women's uh, sexual reproductive rights are human rights, we shouldn't say it in a way that we expect disagreement. We should state it boldly, firmly, that it is a fact, not as if we're asking for anybody to agree, but this is a fact that exists and you cannot disagree. That kind of push. Uh, um, and um, with that, I say again, thank you very much. And this is a very important uh, hearing and, and we ought to uh, um, take your, your, your request very seriously and act on it, which I'm sure the president will inform us that we will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Commissioner Clark. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, Commissioner Mantia, and good morning to everyone. I want to join uh, Commissioner McCauley thanking you for the presentation of this rather complex, um, complex matter, multifaceted matter, because you're dealing with really two things, women human rights defenders which, with their own universal risk, as well as the whole question, very, very contested question of women's rights to bodily autonomy and to choose and to make decisions about their reproduction. Reproductive, re reproduction. Um, several of you gave, a, gave statistics on the harms faced by human rights defenders, attacks, femicides, um, physical attacks as well as digital attacks. And so I, I was wondering if you all could send us those that data because um, it's kind of hard sometimes to, to keep track of it. Uh, so we would be really happy to receive your presentations or or in any way you want to send us the statistics on the harms. I also very much appreciate the analytical lens. You all speak about the feminist approach to the uh, to the issue of of women human rights defenders, situating that feminist approach very much in an understanding of the unequal power relations within which um, feminists are doing their work the human rights defense work, um, advocacy for women's rights as well. Um, and I think that that's really very important to understand that, that those unequal power relations are from the home into the community, into the politics, into the society as lar at large. And also the reminder of the intersectionality. So um, thinking about the, the, the multiple levels of marginalization based on ethnicity, for example, but also really importantly, where access to reproductive um, services is concerned, sexual reproductive services is concerned, the question of income. So if, for example, in the Caribbean, we very much locate this within the context social, of social justice. Whatever is the status of the law, people with income can access safe services and women and people without income may not be able to have that same level of access. So just thanking you for your analytical framework. I also want to ask two or three questions. First of all, for those representatives of the, the Latin American Caribbean Women's Health Network, um, I noticed that you reference Haiti and Suriname. 
as countries uh, which criminalize abortion. Uh, for the rest of the Caribbean, it's there are some countries where you can have, you can access abortion on request, and other countries where abortion is accessible, where women's life uh, is in danger, and that life has been uh, interpreted judicially as mental and physical health, um, life and health, mental and physical health. So I was wondering um, whether or not you all had any data on the advocacy around reproduct sexual reproductive health and rights, access to services as well in the Caribbean, outside of Haiti and Suriname? And what is your analysis of that context, if you have that information? And then more specifically, uh, two questions. Uh, we heard about the, um, the, 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 the digital attacks. And I was wondering, what if you could tell us a little bit more about digital attacks, what form do these attacks take? and whether or not there are laws which deal with digital attacks. In other words, are there remedies and areas of redress for women rights defenders that are being attacked, attacked through um, uh, the digital processes, online processes? And then my last question, um, which I have now forgotten. Okay, yes. The question of allies and progress. Uh, have you noted that there are some countries in the region where progress is being made um, and the advocacy of women human rights defenders is bearing fruit in law reform and in, and in greater access to quality se sexual reproductive health services? And what can we learn from those countries? Lots of questions, sorry. <laughs> Gracias, Comisiona. Eh, bueno, yo... Eh... Thank you, Commissioner. As uh, president and also as a rapporteur for women's rights, I take note of the of the request, especially as regards uh, the strategic plan. I think it's a very important uh, request and it will be considered. And as you, you know, we are drafting that plan. Something else has to do with this traditional lens of uh, human rights defenders, NGOs, and women separately. This has been a division that has been very complicated because, as you very well say, protection seems to be differentiated when actually this is a very high priority. I have some questions. For example, in the case of Sandra Peniche and other defenders' right um, cases, I don't know if there are there have been any. Um, complaints submitted to see what is the link with access to justice. Also, if women defenders have also suffered any type of sexual attack or aggression. Also, you mentioned uh, the issue of the complaints on the part of the family members. I wanted to know if you can expand on that. And going back to the first point, is there any link with other human rights organizations? Because many times these organizations meet, demonstrate, or issue communiques when one human rights defender uh, suffers threats. I don't know if this is the same attitude for women's uh, defenders. Having said this, uh, Rapporteur Zelaya Garcia Munoz, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Madam President. Good morning. Uh, dear co colleagues and civil society representatives, you, there have been already excellent questions posed by the commission, but what I wanted to say is to express my solidarity and sorority, but also my admiration for the work you have been doing. When we speak about women's human rights, there are three great areas and on which we should work, which is fighting violence, discrimination, and to make uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, access a reality. We have been supporting this with a perspective of an indivisibility of human rights. The information that you have presented as regards health has been very important, and this has been linked with education as well, with rights uh, to work, as you have very well mentioned, with economic challenges. What I want to uh, express that is that we would like to receive that report and I want to congratulate you on such an important report. And my question would be if you can expand on the impacts of the pandemic, especially in terms of self-care and care 
in general, which you have uh, very well mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you to all participants of this hearing. I only wanted to share with you that on the joint declaration by the Rapporteurship on Freedom of Expression and um, other rapporteurships for the first time since 1999, there has been a, a reference to freedom of expression in terms of uh, gender issues, such as the eradication of discrimination and prejudice, um, attack on freedom of expression for women, uh, online safety, and particularly there is a chapter as regards the access to information, including what we consider to be a duty for states to guarantee access to sexual and reproductive health uh, rights. Also, since the report on 2021 of our rapporteurship, in each of the 35 countries, there is a chapter called Fight Against Discrimination and Exclusion. And I wanted to share this with you to encourage you to take a look at that report and to uh, provide feedback on, on the scope of that report. And also to say that we are continuing working on this. And also lastly, lastly I would like to say that we are all available to receive suggestions as to how we can reinforce or strengthen our mandate, which is a very much a priority within the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Rapporteur. I only, only wanted to say that I was working with the Rapporteur to present uh, that declaration, and it's very important to have dissemination of that report. And uh, the, the whole Rapporteurship is at, uh, available to that. We have time, and Commissioner McCauley is asking for the floor, so uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam President. When uh, um, the special rapporteur for um, um, freedom of expression started speaking, I realized I'd forgotten to mention one of the things I wanted to say in relation to training, which was in relation to the media in all, all forms of media as to the language that they sometimes use because sometimes the language which is used by the media is not ad so advisable in, in, in the recognition of the rights uh, and, and in fact detracts from it. So I think they also fall, must fall within the category of special training um, for this uh, um, area of women's rights. That, that's what I want to say, thank you. Thank you very much. I give the floor to the civil society for 30 minutes then. First of all, thank you very much to all of you for your questions and your comments. The questions are quite uh, a few and we uh, very quickly uh, distributed the questions while you, we were listening to you. We hope we can address all of them. But uh, we can also submit uh, written information. As regards the first question that was uh, posed in terms of the perpetrators that have been identified for the attacks that we have suffered, Right now, we don't have uh, statistics in terms of gender of perpetrators, but actually uh, in terms of their category. For example, we mentioned state agents, officials, public officials, which may include women as well, or police agents or armed forces agents. We also mentioned fundamentalists fundamentalist group members, which many times are led by women as well. This is also the case and women participate in all spaces. So this also is the case uh, for perpetrators that we have identified. 
to us it's very important to see this under this terms and maybe not to make that distinction because as regards uh, whether if they are women or not that could lead us to think this uh, to, with a stigmatization logic because uh, to say, well, women attack women, we attack uh, each other. This is something, an argument that is used to attack us and it's not necessarily the reality. But of course, we are aware that within this uh, areas, there are women perpetrators, but we don't have that disaggregated data. We could uh, nevertheless start researching on that. And of course, we would uh, submit that information to you. And then as regards uh, other, another of the questions, I think it was uh, Soledad, the reporter who uh, asked us to uh, submit the, pre the presentation, of course, we'll send the written report, but of them, we could also uh, expand on the information. And a question we received as regards um attacks by family members. This is uh, something that is particular we found as regards attacks for women human rights defenders. This is why we uh, made the distinction because many times as women, we can be immersed in a family environment that is violent against us because as we see the exercise of human rights advocacy also implies a, a political action of leaving that space that was traditionally reserved for for men but we are trying to to overcome that that limit that limitation so i do think it's important to know that we can also provide specific data as regards the the attacks uh committed by this group of perpetrators, family members specifically. And for the for the following question, I give the floor to my colleague, Clara. Thank you, Karina. Thank you very much for all the questions and the interest on delving deeper into what we presented. First, to respond on the facts related to abortion and in the Caribbean, in our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, the countries in which there is completely prohibited is El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. As regards uh, the Caribbean, Antigua and Barbuda, and Dominica have uh, some exceptions. In Grenada, there are also some exceptions to save women's life and preserve their physical and mental health. In Barbados, St. Vincent and Grenadines, there, is, there are no risks restrictions and also there are no restrictions in Cuba, the Guyanas and Puerto Rico. This is the outlook for the Caribbean. As regards the question made by Commissioner Margaret in terms of uh, training for officials, I will uh, also bring the question of uh, Soledad Garcia. Well, our organization has uh, a model and the health network also has its own model. These are alternatives for uh, psychological, physical assistance, which are comprehensive to, to assist and accompany women defenders that have suffered trauma due to their work, who are at danger and who require physical, psychological assistance. And our initiative also has its own uh, model called CASAS, where we receive these women defenders that require all this type of assistance. The health network has some uh, in-person programs to implement collective psychological and, and physical assistance programs. These are alternatives which have allowed women defenders to not be alone during the pandemic so that they could have effective channels to address traumas and find spaces to heal and to have alternatives to improve their mental 
and physical health. And in terms of uh, officials uh, training, we would like most states, uh, state agents be interested in be trained in be educated and to and to, to have information on these issues to address also to, to, to assist victims and to understand and to know what uh, body autonomy means our network has a connection with the state and it has provided different administration uh, different uh, training courses for example this year we will start with um, course uh, diplomas course with uh, public officials in Bolivia we're also working on uh, religious freedom which is uh, directly related with uh, dismantling different mentalities that restrict access to sexual and reproductive rights I hope I was able to answer uh, what you had posed thank you I would like to add two elements, one that has to do with digital attacks. As we were saying, we have a monitoring system and we moved from 7% of aggressions in 2020 to a 25% in 2021. This obviously has to do with the fact that because of the pandemic, many uh, women human rights defenders activities were conducted in online spaces as you know digital spaces are the spaces through which we disseminate information we held forums and in this context there have been a series of attacks on social media this is something that we know that happens and we have permanent monitoring on women defenders, especially the most visible uh, defenders, we monitor them. And we have some colleagues who, defend, who suffer daily attacks. And sometimes we, these are just troll accounts. Um, it's not people, but accounts administered by a single person. You have several accounts administered by the same person, managed by the same person. In some contexts, such as El Salvador or what is happening in Mesoamerica, the digital space is an extension of the physical space, and threats in the digital space begin the pattern of attacks and it escalates. People are then physical harassed and especially women defenders. And we see that also women defenders then are surveilled not only in social media or in online spaces, but also physically where they work. And another element that I would like to mention in El Salvador we have the context of a system of exception, a state of exception, and hundreds of people are being detained every day. And we are concerned about those women who were released after facing sentences because of the sanctioning of abortion, because many people were released, not, many women were released not because of being declare innocent, they receive a pardon or their sentences were exchanged by they have a criminal background. So they are detained them again within this context. And that's a concern. Many women are victims, survivors of violence, and they become defenders. And they are the speak persons on behalf of other women which are penalized or sanctioned because of abortion in El Salvador. It's important to recognize how important these online spaces are for us. And we need to call upon states so that they create spaces of dialogue to discuss on sexual and reproductive 
rights, and it's also important to recognize the work of women defenders. I would like to add something. When we talk about perpetrators, we need to focus on religious and fundamentalist groups. They are the ones who create attack and harassment strategies against women, sexual and reproductive rights defenders, especially uh, they attack women defenders who support uh, those women uh, who exercise their sexual and reproductive rights. So we need to focus on those perpetrators, on those actors that are one of the most, the, the strongest in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and they have a role in several international spaces. Thank you. Thank you. And with regard to the questions about a specific cases, I would like to talk about the increase of aggressions against defenders. This also leads to more impunity. Aggressions in digital spaces um, increase impunity since investigations into these attacks are not investigated, are not conducted. Authorities lack training to investigate into these online attacks on virtual or online spaces. We have the case of Sandra Peniche. Um, it's the case of a Mexican woman. And we saw that these campaigns led to physical aggressions then. In the case of Sandra Peniche, the attack and the smear campaigns were conducted and this led to an attack. Initially, there was an investigation into an attempt of murder, but then it was um, classified as minor injuries. And as a result, the perpetrator was held in a psychiatric hospital because he was an addict and therefore there was no investigation into the attempt of murder. It ended up being a case on minor injuries and the person, the perpetrator ended up in a psychiatric hospital. So this is an example to show you that defenders of reproductive and sexual rights are always in a situation of impunity because investigations are hindered. This is the case of Sandra Peniche, but it shows the alternatives and the possibilities about what happens with the aggressions and attacks suffered by women defenders. And my colleague Clara will talk about the Mexican context. We see that in Mexico, there has been progress regarding the recognition of sexual and reproductive rights, but this has also increased the work of these fundamentalist groups. Um, um, therefore, women defenders are being attacked and they are being exposed and their right to freedom of expression is being violated. Many of the public statements made by these women defenders led to repression. And many women defenders cannot denounce because of the actions of uh, some entities. For example, there are different administrative proceedings that are initiated against them. Sometimes that ends in a small fine, but they cannot monitor, for example, the police officers who attack them when they protest. So that's all on our side. 
uh, we have time, so I don't know if my colleagues would like to add something else. I just want to add uh, something after the interventions of the commissioners, especially what Commissioner Julissa Mantilla said um, regarding our request to include women defenders of human of sexual and reproductive rights being included in the strategic plan. I think that this could be considering the situation of defenders of sexual and reproductive rights in thematic reports or in other reports of the commission. I think that for future reports that you are planning, it would be good to include a situation of this group of women defenders, or maybe you could uh, establish a priority regarding precautionary measures uh, for women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, maybe when you can, when you make recommendations, it would be good to include this integral protection approach that is not only for uh, women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights, but is for all women defenders. And this is an approach, a perspective that we have created together. And this is an alternative response um, to facing the ineffectiveness of state mechanisms, if they exist, because there are only a few mechanisms. There are only some states who have created affirmative actions to protect women defenders. I also would like to insist on the fact that for us, the space of the Inter-American Commission is a space of allies. I, we hope that you keep your commitment to women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights and that you keep working to condemn or to celebrate, depending on the context. Um, it's important that the commission keeps its progressive perspective. Um, we, um, as Commissioner Margaret was saying, is we don't have to request that reproductive rights are human rights. They are just human rights. But sometimes we feel um, we are seeing that international inter-American spaces that this discussion is not a priority. And we are seeing that there are risks of regressions on this type of rights. And we have made a lot of progress so far, so that's why we fear so much this. Finally, on behalf of the Mesoamerica Initiative and the Women's Health Network, we would like to thank the IACHR for accepting this request. This was a lot of support for the work that we are doing in terms of research and monitoring the situation of women defenders. We would like to thank um, the commissioners and all of those who were present today. Thank you for hearing us and assuming this commitment uh, to be civilizing the situation of women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights. What we want to do is to make the situation visible so that everyone knows what is happening to us women defenders of sexual and reproductive rights in the Americas. We would like that the IACHR, an ally to us, especially in terms of feminist causes, we want to promote this visibility. We will send today's presentation, but also all the document research studies and follow-up studies that we have so that you can see the sources of our research you will find a lot of information there. And these two networks have the commitment to keeping the ISCHR informed. Thank you so much. So we are reaching the end of this hearing. I would like to thank you for being here, but also for your daily defense and advocacy for sexual and reproductive rights 
I would like to say this clearly as president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Reproductive and sexual rights are human rights. You are suffering all these attacks and retaliation. I have some comments for you. When Aura was mentioning the case of Sandra Peniche, it would be interesting to see why it, uh, her case was not considered a feminicide. And that's an important uh, case to make situations visible. A woman that is a defender and she suffers an attack. So we need to see why her case was not considered a feminicide attempt. Um, we also uh, took what you are saying very seriously that these women defenders group should be considered a priority. And when we talk about obstructing violence as a human rights violation or a case of torture, that reminds us all that torture uh, is seen in different terms. And what happened to women in private spheres was sometimes not considered a violation. And what we are seeing is that things have changed and the rapporteurship on women's rights and the rapporteurship of human rights defenders will take all your things or all your statements into consideration. Also in the case of El Salvador, uh, in which women were um, sanctioned and then women defenders were attacked. And this is happening all the time across history. Last year, for the first time, the commission has a board of women and now the court has three women judges and that has not been easy. We have made progress through protests and when we demand our rights. And I wanted to say this and I thank you for being so honest, especially when you fear regressions. Um, the fact that we women are here and we know the cost of this, which is huge. And the commission will never stop recognizing the cost paid and the effort made. Commissioners are chosen by a state, but we are not ambassadors. We represent the struggle for human rights. So I want to guarantee publicly the recognition of women's human rights and also of sexual and reproductive rights, rest assured. And I know that it's easy to talk to you, but I would like to address also all the girls and adolescents that could be watching this hearing. In the previous period of sessions, we have a hearing with Ecuadorian girls. These girls are uh, human rights defenders regarding sexual adaptation in school. This group was created after the ruling Pablo, Paola Guzman against Ecuador. This girl that committed suicide after being a victim of sexual violence. Uh, the hearing is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, I invite you to watch it. Uh, to watch it. These girls were saying, I want that nobody goes through which I, she went through. And I think that this is a light of hope for women in the region because girls are also making these rights visible. And at the time I made them a promise on behalf of the commission. I told them, you, we are here keeping this place for you. And that's a commitment that we have in the Inter-American Commission with this comprehensive, diverse perspective. We have the evolutive principle of human rights. We need to keep and to maintain the principle of non-discrimination above all. We thank you for the information. We, all the rapporteurs are also working and all the rapporteurships of the commission are working for this. You are not alone. You can count on us. Having said this, I would like to adjourn this hearing. Have a nice day and thank you so much. Thank you very much.